John Henry, um, it's a project of um, the Willard Mountain DAR. Willard Mountain DAR comes out of Washington County, where I, where I reside, where I reside, and I've been living there for the last 30 years. A little the hamlet of Greenwich, um, and they came to me and asked me to copy this photograph, this family photograph that they knew that um, that Willard Mountain had. Um, and there, um, the librarian, the volunteer there, introduced me to the family photo album of John Henry. Now, John Henry is a famous name in American folklore. John Henry, the steel driving man. And there are about, oh geez, there are at least a hundred um, John Henrys that claim to be that John Henry. A very popular name during that time period. Uh, and I too am going to uh, put in my bid for our John Henry to be the John Henry. Uh, and I do that because of his history. He was a blacksmith. Everything I know about John Henry comes from his obituary written in 1911. From the Whitehall Times. And I'd really like to start my whole tour reading this. John Henry was a slave in Confederate Virginia. John L. Henry, a prominent and respected resident of Whitehall for nearly half a century, died at his home here Friday night after an illness of five weeks. For a year, Mr. Henry's sight had been failing him, and he was operated on at the Albany Hospital for Cataract. But owing to advanced age, recovery was impossible. The deceased was born at Charlottesville, Virginia, of parents owned as slaves by the president of the University of Virginia. The University of Virginia, this is when I might go off a little bit, the University of Virginia built a trans-state rail line to the coal fields of West Virginia. They built this rail line. This is why I petition our John Henry to be the John Henry. Mr. Henry was reared as a slave and from the time and from time to time under several masters. During the Civil War, Mr. Henry was employed as a blacksmith, again, working with steel, by the Confederate, I like how they say he was employed as a blacksmith by the Confederate government. I doubt if he was employed a slave. But during the latter part of the conflict, he drifted as contraband. Contraband was a term used during the American Civil War to describe certain escaped slaves or those who joined with Union forces and became free once they crossed Union lines. These men supported Union efforts and were paid wages. The Union Army helped support and educate their families. Thousands of men from these camps enlisted in the United States Colored Troops when recruitment was started in 1863. At the end of the war, there were more than a hundred contraband camps in the South, including the Freedmen's Colony of Roanoke Island, where 3,500 former slaves worked to develop a self-sufficient community. Back to my story, but during the latter part of the conflict, he drifted as contraband across the Union lines and eventually became the body servant of Lieutenant William Boyd of the 5th New York Cavalry. Calvary, blacksmith, all right, a match made in heaven, um, and came to Whitehall in 1865 with Lieutenant Boyd. Um, Mr. Henry has lived in Whitehall continuously since coming here. Now, Lieutenant Boyd is a magic figure in his own right. Uh, Lieutenant Boyd uh, started out as a private in the Union Army. He was the son of a congressman. Um, and he disappeared from more records. I strongly believe he deserted. But he reappears as a lieutenant um, in New York's 5th, the 5th Cavalry. Um, he was captured, 
um, captured as a prisoner of war, escaped, and still made his way north. When he was captured, he had enough time to write his mother a letter. Uh, and this is uh, Maryland, September 14th, 1862. My dear mother, do not be alarmed at my prolonged neglect in writing. I have passed through a great many hardships and trials since I last wrote to you. At the Battle of Centerville, I was struck in the side and leg by pieces of a spent shell and left on the field. In the morning, I was picked up by some rebel cavalry belonging to Stuart. And I take it that's Jeb Stuart. Um, and taken to Centerville. I was not injured so bad, but what I could walk, and they made me walk all the way. On arriving at Centerville, I was divested of my sword and revolver and what money I had about 98 cents, and placed in charge of a rebel surgeon. He placed me in an ambulance. After dressing my wounds, I was soon after driven away. I knew not in what direction we were going. They were going. I asked the driver several times, but he did not seem very talkative, and I could not get nothing, and I could get nothing out of him. I rode all night and the next morning until 11 o'clock. I then was permitted to know where I was. I found myself at Point of Rock on the Maryland side. I never was so surprised in my life. I had not thought of their crossing into Maryland. I stayed there nearly all day until the troops had all crossed and then came with them to Frederick. On arriving in the city, I was placed in the hospital where I now am. They did not hold Frederick very long. The night before last, I heard the the cannonading commenced, and I knew they could not hold the city. As soon as I saw they contemplated retreating, I thought I would try and make my escape. But I had no need to trouble myself. They had left in such haste, they did not think of me, and I am again free. It was a very careless piece of business, my getting into trouble at all. I will tell you how it was. We left Centerville about 10 o'clock at night, with the intention of falling back on Fairfax. We had to cross a small brook directly in front of their battery. While crossing, one of my leggings fell off, and I stepped out of company and went back to get it. And while stooping to get it, I was struck. The wounds were slight. My side is quite sore. I think the injury hurt me more inward, inwardly. I did not break this, it did not break the skin except in my leg. One small piece came near spoiling my right leg forever, but it, was, but it merely grazed the bone, marking a flesh wound, and will soon be well again. I was stunned for the time and could not reach the company and was so captured. I should not wonder if I was home before many days. And that's the end of the letter. The rest of it was all deteriorated. Um... But yeah, so much for a Lieutenant William Boyd, who I think probably could deserves a movie in his own right. Um, the urban legend of Whitehall has it that uh, Mr. Henry, or John Henry, um, came into town riding a white horse, announcing the, uh, the coming of its native son, Lieutenant William Boyd. Mr. Henry had lived in Whitehall continuously since coming here, following the, the, following the occupation of blacksmith, and has always been well thought of. He belonged to the Methodist Church for 25 years, being a consistent member. Those who survive are two daughters, Maddie B. and Isabella V., and a half-brother, Charles James of Charlottesville, Virginia. His wife died in 1907. The funeral was held at the late home uh, Monday afternoon at 2 o'clock with Reverend J.B. Armstrong officiating. There was singing by a quartet composed of J.F. Clark, George Johnson, Mrs. L.M. Rich, and Mrs. Charles Barker. I like to mention these names because um, um, historians out there may know of these names and could further my my investigation into the life and times of, uh, of John Henry. Um, this last name, Mrs. Charles Barker. Um, these photographs 
some of them are have the photographer's credit and one of the credits is a Mr. Barker from Whitehall um, yeah Charles Barker from Whitehall so it's nice to see or for me it's it's kind of nice to see that his photographer was also his friend um, you know that is his that, you know they would think enough to sing at his funeral the Barkers um, the bearers were L.M. Rich L.K. Pierce, J.P. Gillette, Fred Bartholomew, Cornelius Hardy, and Harvey Bartholomew. Burial was in the family plot in the Boardman Cemetery, which is still there. Uh, Miss Molly E. Hed Hegman of Troy was among the out-of-town relatives at the funeral. June 29, 1911. Okay, so now I'll go on these photographs. Even though it said that only two children survived, John Henry had five children. Five children, actually this photograph is this photograph. I should hold this one up. And in this family photograph there are four of his children. Um, and if you look carefully at them, you'll see that they all have some birth abnormality. Um, I'm blessed that my neighbor is a doctor and I had him do a diagnosis via photograph. <laughs> he told me don't tell anyone that he said this. Um, but he thought it was spina bifida. Or as they called it back in the day, hunchback. And if you look at Bella, and she's the one at the piano, there is a marked arch on her back. There are a few photographs of John Henry in his blacksmith shop, which was so successful, he had as many as five uh, workmen. Oh, this is a very unique, beautiful photograph of... Uh, of Bella, the daughter at the piano, and you can see she's of quite short stature, almost dwarf-like, but she is in the accompaniment of these really very well-dressed white people. It is a society of the Methodist Church. And it was a literary society um, meant to inspire, and this society still exists in the Methodist Church, meant to inspire Christianity and um, good citizenship uh, among the, um, the youth of the church. I love this photograph because Bella is standing alongside other members of the society. She doesn't have a broom in her hand. She's as dressed as well as they are. Um, And she's an equal. She's she's wearing, and this and these photographs, it's hard to date them, uh, because they literally span from the period of tin types, all the way to uh, Carta Vistas. Uh, so that you can go to the early 1900s, uh, 1917 from about 1870. Um, yeah, Bella Henry was quite the girl. She had a sister, Georgiana, who died at 19. And Bella wrote an obituary to her, which I'd like to read, just to show um, her, her literary prowess. A voice that we loved is silent now, the beating heart is stilled. Death's seized hand has brushed her brow, and life's warm current chilled. We should not mourn with sorrowing heart or breathe with for her a sigh. She had chosen the better part for her t'was gain to die. We know she is safe in that beautiful land where sorrow and death never come. At whole pearly gates bright angels stand to welcome the faithful home. 
as the happy spirited pulsed for flight and the world but a passing dream she saw the beautiful light from heavenly mansions gleam then calmly yielding up her breath to God by whom twas given she passed through the valley of death to that bright home in heaven I think it's really quite a poem to write to your sister um, from a little black girl in the um, turn of the century and by the turn of the century I meant from 1800s to the 1900s Bella also had a candy shop and her candies were shipped as far away as Seattle this again too is in the early 1900s I use these photographs to spur stories for me. This unbelievably handsome couple, I have no idea who they are. Unmarked. As are the vast majority of photographs. Here we have in this gold frame um, photograph is Emma Emma Henry who started out as Emma Baltimore. She was one of the Baltimores of Troy. The Baltimores of Troy were an old and ancient family, um, literally starting in Troy from the 1700s. Urban legend had it that uh, Samuel Baltimore, Emma's grandfather, fought in the Revolutionary War. And um, his own, like it was common practice, promised him freedom if he fought in the war. Well, his owner reneged, also common practice, on his promise. So Samuel uh, Baltimore freed himself. He literally just started walking north, got as far as Troy, where he found comfort, he found food, he found work. Work as a barber. Opened a barber shop that became very popular. Um, became so popular that he married a nurse, had ten children, and set his children off. Set his children off much like... Um, much like branches of a business, much like um, they were all well-educated, industrious by all measure, um, and he put the, he set them up in business. Um, the um, I'm trying to think of all of the prominent black families in the area. They all come from Baltimore's. Uh, I guess the most prominent one I'm thinking of now is uh, an old black family in Saratoga, the Dagses. They come from the Baltimore's. Um, they also come from the Latimer's. Um, a very old and um, very um, well-respected family. Um, and when I think of all of the um, wonderful things that John Henry did, you think of him as a slave. And as a slave in Virginia, I'm sure he could not read and write. Even though he might have been a blacksmith, I'm sure he didn't know measurements. I'm sure he did not know his numbers, and certainly not his letters. And Emma <laughs> is the one who made him a champion. He had his own stationery. A blacksmith with stationery? No, I'm sure that was Emma's idea. Ah. Oh. This is the pretty couple in the, uh, in the photo album. I say the vast majority of these photographs are, can't be identified. But this fellow, this very light-skinned, handsome fellow, well-dressed, he was identified. He was identified almost immediately. A fr Paul and Mary Liz Stewart of the Underground Railroad History Project of the Capital Region. Paul, being a baseball fan, immediately told me that this was Stanislaw Costa Govern. Stanislaw Costa Govern was black baseball's renaissance man, 1854 to 1924. He was also a labor organizer, a journalist, and a Shakespearean actor who managed the first professional black team, the Cuban Giants. Um, I have to say, too, in this photo album, you don't see it in this photograph, but Stanislaw's face is crossed out. Literally a cross in it. Yeah, why? 
I have no idea. Unless he just looked a little too good. He is really quite the handsome fellow. Um, let me go on about Stanislaw. Stanislaw um, Costa Govern was a native of St. Croix in the Virgin Islands. Judging by his appearance, it's fair to guess that he was half European and that in the United States he, be he became part of society's mulatto elite. In 1868, the 13-year-old Stanislaw came to the U.S. serving as a cabin boy aboard the training ship Monohila Gala. As a teenager and young adult, Govern lived in Washington, D.C., where black baseball players were definitely active. There's a lot written about Stanislaw Costa Govern. He, uh, and it's all from the... Um, Baseball has a website on the history of baseball, and they've given him a good three, three pages and two pages of, uh, of research, of where the research came from. I'm going to skip a lot because uh, I just really want to get to the essence of this guy. In August 1890, Sporting Life carried an item noting that this team, the Cuban Giants, was touring northern New York and Vermont. Govern's address was given as the Hotel Champlain, a resort in Plattsburgh, New York, just down the lake from, White, from Whitehall. His social consciousness was his married marriage in 1888 to Elizabeth B. Myers the granddaughter of black abolitionist publisher Stephen Myers, who was head of the New York uh, Underground Railroad in Albany. This beauty is also in the album, but she's unidentified. I'm gonna skip a couple of pages. to this beauty, who I strongly feel is her sister. This woman is identified in the album, and she's identified as Catherine Myers, sister, whoops, whoops, sister to Elizabeth. Who, was, who we know was married to a Stanislaw Costa. How all three of them are in the album. What their relationship was to John Henry or Emma, um, Emma Baltimore Henry, I do not know. So all you history detectives out there, get, to, get busy. This photo here is Georgiana. The sister that passed away at 19 years of age. And I believe this is Georgiana here also. With a baby carriage. Which I think says how well off the uh, John Henrys were. And this is Bella. Bella, the daughter who, uh, who actually lived into adulthood. The daughter who uh, showed uh, definite signs of uh, spina bifida. The daughter who had the candy store. Um, the daughter who was the literary, I think, a literary giant. I wish I could find more writings by her. Uh, she did keep an album, uh, not an album, a diary. And one day, when I get very brave, I'll try to decipher it. The diary is written like this. Should I come closer? It is such a scramble of, of letters. I mean, the handwriting is good, but she's literally writing on top of herself. Yeah, and a lot of it is just reports of the weather and who came to visit. 
um, but without identif you know, matching identifying marks on the uh, on these photographs, I just really don't know who's who. Bella again. Epworth Society. That's the society of the um, of the Methodist Church. The Epworth Society. Oh, this young girl here. And this is another remarkable thing about this album that I think is a testimony to, to their, um, to how well off the, um, not just the, not just the Henrys, but their friends, their, their associates were, is a child so well dressed, and this one too is labeled Miss, and I emphasize the word Miss, because look, she's only probably about six years old here, Miss um, James. And, you know, some kids are very precocious. When I think that they wrote Miss James on here, it makes me think she must have been one precocious little girl. And this little boy, who I think dollar for dollar would give a little Lord Flournoy a run for his money when it came to fashion. Ah. Uh, now we come to this very light-skinned very well coughed woman who's labeled and whose photograph shows up more times in the album than any other person is Matilda Henry. Matilda Henry. John Henry mentions Matilda as one of his surviving children. Matilda is an excellent example of how we all don't look alike. She's very light-skinned, uh, and if you remember John Henry, photographs of John Henry, he's quite dark, and so is, so is Emma. Where did she come from? Going back to the family album, where there are four of their five children, there's no picture of Matilda Henry. Matilda lived quite a long time. She lived into the 30s. And she lived in Michigan at that time. Yeah. Matilda Henry. Now, one of the, uh, I want to say, common practices of, um, of black folks, especially during this time period, a uh, first generation removed from slavery, is, uh, is adoption. It's to take in, take in children. And I think that's what Matilda Henry was. I think she was taken in. How old she was taken in, I think she must have been, you know, an, an older child, certainly not an infant, uh, because there are no infant pictures of her. And we know that the Henrys got lots of infant pictures of their children, of the ones that eventually passed on. Um, and most of them passed on in their infancy. Another reason why I think it gives great... Uh, Credence to uh, to think that Matilda was uh, adopted into their uh, into their family. Now this is a very unique picture of some Baltimores. Emma Baltimore is in here. She's off, and her sister, and I believe her brother. How did Emma Baltimore meet John Henry? Well, she had a brother who was working in Whitehall. He was a clothing scourer. Today we'd call that a dry cleaner. Um, and I'm sure on one of her visits, and her brother, he was um, cer certainly knew John Henry. I mean, the black population there was very small. Um, and I'm sure they were associates. And uh, you know how it is when your sister's coming to, coming to visit. Hey, I got a guy for you, you know, and it was John Henry. These, again, all unidentified. Now, I really love this picture. I love this picture so much, I reproduce it a lot. This woman, not only attractive, well coughed, but look at that dress. You didn't go into stores and buy dresses like this. You had to make them. And one of the major ac occupations for black women at the time was as a seamstress. 
And I bet you dollar for dollar, man, that she made this dress. What a testimony to her skill and, uh, and her sense of design. Everything, everything about it is just, I think, really nice. Uh, let me go on again to unidentified males. Now, if you remember in the obituary, um, it said that uh, John Henry had a um, had a half brother, and his half brother came north, came north after the Civil War and visited him. And I can't help but think that somebody, somewhere in here, someone is his brother. But again, so many pictures are. Or can't be identified. Here's another photograph of Matilda Henry. Matty, I think they called her. M-A-T-I-E is how they spelt it. But her full name was Matilda, so would it be Matty, Matty? Um, this guy here is just too handsome for words. I don't know who he is. Um... Where was I? I was giving a talk somewhere, and someone said it was Alfonso Northup, Solomon Northup's son. Uh, I got a hold of the Northup family, and um, they said no. They said he doesn't. He doesn't look like anyone that they have pictures of, uh, and he doesn't look like anyone in the family today. Ah, but this handsome fellow is P. K. Moore. P.K. Moore. P.K. Moore was the president of New York State's Anti-Slavery Society. Now, I'm figuring this photograph, I think it was a card of this day, dates from about 1917, 1911. Um, so, Anti-Slavery Society, that late? I mean, if the nation had even gotten rid of slavery by then. No, I don't think so. And considering that he is a young man, I'm thinking this has got to be P.K. Moore's son, or maybe even grandson. But still, watch chain, derby hat, no one in this photograph is in, is in rags. Everyone is really dressed to the nines. This strong woman is Emma Baltimore's mother, who had a reputation in Troy of being a wonderful nurse. Here she is again, too. This is just a darker reproduction. Ah. Oh. I want to highlight this fellow only because he was our neighbor from Massachusetts. He ran for the Massachusetts Common Council. Um, he never won, but he introduced a law that uh, allowed black officers to be um, in charge of black troops. Initially when black troops were recruited they were going to be under only under white officers command. Again too another picture of Matilda a different one and another gentleman just a handsome gentleman and I'm like is this John Henry's brother? Is this John Henry's brother? And here's this photograph again, I love to think, is William Boyd and John Henry. Now, in our uh, legend of John Henry, in our uh, stories of John Henry, the steel-driving man, he's big and muscular and tough. And yeah. And if you look at our John Henry, no, he looks like he looks like 50 years of slavery. He looks like he's been working in the uh, on that anvil and hammer and steel for a long time, really hard. This photograph also tells us where his shop was located. If you look in the background, there's horses and a train car. What a great place for a blacksmith to be.
near the freight yards. So I doubt very much if this guy could read or write. And yet he builds a thriving business, a business that does so well that he can afford not just photography, but keep his wife well coughed and dressed, uh, educate all of his children, um, donate, be a, a, a contributing member to not just his church, but to the town where they wrote an obituary. I mean, the obituary is pretty glowing. Um, and it's 1911. And he's not one generation removed from slavery, like his children were, or even his wife. He was a slave. Um, I just think his skills just had to be, had to be up there. Um, and um, I, was, I was from the generation where um, to be equal, you've got to be better. So I can, I can only imagine. You know, I'm, I'm a child of the 60s. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not new to protesting for racial equality. But today, I think the thing that, that um, makes me feel good is so many of these protesters are white. You know, they, they we got friends. John Henry had friends. He made friends. Um, and that's, I mean, when you're only 10% of the population, you better make some friends. You need friends. And he had friends. And that's another nice thing. I'm talking about their friends. Um, the photo album probably has a good 12, yeah, probably 12 out of 96 photographs uh, of white people. You know? You're not going to keep a picture of uh, somebody you don't like or somebody who treated you bad. You know, I take these photographs wherever I can. I say, I've, you know, it's, it's, let me, let me thank uh, um, Grant's Cottage for inviting me here. Okay, let me end by pleading to you all. If you have any information, comments, or suggestions, places for me to look, but please get in touch with me. Clifford Oliver, 527 um, at gmail.com. Thank you.